Hi. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. It's great to see such an excited and enthusiastic audience. Um, it's really serendipitous that I'm here since I just flew in a couple of days ago. And many, uh, several other people, in fact, are serendipitously here. And I think we'll all be treated to a wonderful talk today um, by Dr. Lustig. So um, I, I asked uh, our staff assistant to Xerox his resume. But luckily, I said, put two pages on each sheet and do it two-sided. So I didn't have to kill three forests. Um, the, I stopped copying at page 70. But um, by the time we hit page 70, even by just a few pages into the resume, um, we were just so interested to see the different things that Dr. Lustig has participated in, uh, one of which you'll be glad to know he's now a film star, soon to be, be a Sundance next year. Um, and he's uh, written this book called Fat Chance, um, which I think you'll hear sort of the wisdom behind some of those messages. And we share a lot of common interests because, you know, we've been working of recent years on uh, dietary glycemia, and he has certainly taken it to the extreme, and uh, even went as far as going last year to law school. So not only is he an advocate, but he's an advocate, right, so that he can advocate uh, for a healthier diet. And I, I think, again, we'll be treated to some of that message uh, during his talk. Um, and if that's not good enough, um, he was also on the short list. Uh, he is on the short list of the best doctors of America. So um, with that, Dr. Lustig, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Alan. Thank, thank all of you for being here. I, I, really, I cannot tell you what a joy and a pleasure and at the same time, a, uh, uh, an adventure coming to Tufts is because, you know, this is, you know, where sort of uh, nutrition in the latter part of the 20th century took off, you know, in terms of uh, Jean Meir and what happened afterwards. So, you know, I, I, uh, I recognize and I respect the, uh, the history uh, that this place uh, um, uh, uh, represents. And I hope I'm going to not be too extreme, but at the same time, uh, you know, try to open your eyes as to what I think is going on in terms of chronic metabolic disease and why children uh, are the uh, uh, recipients of what uh, you might, uh, you know, categorize as, you know, uh, not, not their fault. And you'll see why I say that in a minute. First of all, I have no disclosures. Uh, no food industry concern is putting me up to this, I promise you. So here's the mistake right here. Notice, this is from 2001, Time Magazine. Six million kids are seriously overweight. Well, you know, with all of the information, with all of the media attention, with all of the NIH funding, with Michelle Obama's vegetable gardens, we are now up to 20 million and counting. The question is, is that the problem? Is obesity the problem? Yes. Everyone says obesity is the reason for everything else that comes downstream of it. I would pose to you that I'm not nearly that sure of that. I, in fact, I think that that is actually a mistake, and I'll explain why. So here's a Venn diagram of the United States adult population. 30% obese, 72 million, 70% 70 normal weight, 168 million. And the standard mantra that everyone espouses, that is, the food industry, the federal government, and unfortunately, the medical profession as well, they say that 80% of that 30%, 80% of the obese population are metabolically ill. They get type 2 diabetes, they get hypertension, they get dyslipidemia, they get cardiovascular disease, they get cancer, they get dementia, they get all these chronic metabolic diseases, it's their fault. And if they would only just diet and exercise, we could solve our way out of this problem. Eat less, exercise more, it's their fault. That's the standard mantra, and you will hear it pretty much from everybody. I think this is a mistake, and here's why. Yes, 80% of obese people are metabolically ill, that's true. But that means that 20% of obese people are metabolically healthy. In fact, they harbor no signs of any of the biochemical phenotypes that we associate with obesity. They will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not cost the taxpayer a dime. They're just fat. Conversely, 
40% of the normal weight population harbor the same metabolic dysfunctions as do the obese. They get hypertension, they get dyslipidemia, they get type 2 diabetes, they get cardiovascular disease, they get cancer, they get dementia, yeah, at a slightly lower rate, no argument. Obesity is certainly associated with those diseases, but it is not the cause of those diseases. And when you do the math, that 40% of 70% is 67 million. They actually outclass the sick obese. And when you add the two of them together, whether you're sick, obese or not, it's more than half the U.S. population. So if it's not just a matter of eating too much and exercising too little, then it can't be a matter of behavior. In fact, this looks much more like an exposure. Not a behavior, an exposure. So let's go back to the last public health crisis that we all experienced, HIV. 1979, patient zero. 1981, the term AIDS gets coined. 1984, Gallo and Montagnier discover the AIDS virus. 1986, our Surgeon General Chick Coop says, you know, we got a problem here. What year did HIV become a public health crisis? What day? What time? There's actually a date and a time associated with this. Anybody know? November 12, 1991 at 11.30 Central Standard Time because that was when the press conference was held where Magic Johnson revealed that he had HIV. And that was the moment it became a public health crisis because everyone went, holy, this could happen to me. This isn't just about the gays and the addicts and the hemophiliacs anymore. I could get this. And that was the moment it became a public health crisis because it wasn't about behavior anymore. Now it was about exposure. That's what this is. This is an exposure. The question is, exposure to what? Now, I can prove that this is the case because you're all familiar with these one-slice CT or MRIs through the abdomen. So here are equally weighted and equally BMI'd gentlemen. One is healthy, one is sick. The physicians in the room know which one is sick. How about some basic scientists? You want to tell me which one is the sick one? A or B? B, why? More, fat. More visceral fat. More intra-abdominal fat. So this guy up here, he's just got love handles, you know, something to hold on to. But down here, this is the guy who's sick. He's metabolically ill at the same rate, actually um, higher than this guy. So you can have thin obese. In fact, this is called TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside, a term coined by Dr. Jimmy Bell, a neuroimager at University College London. So bottom line, Bottom line is, it doesn't matter how fat you are, it matters how sick you are, because that's where the money goes. So obesity is not the problem. You don't die of obesity. Obesity is not on anybody's death certificates. Metabolic syndrome is the problem, and that's where all the money goes. 75% of all healthcare dollars go to diseases that are associated with metabolic syndrome. And of those, it is estimated that 75% of those are recoupable. We wouldn't need uh, uh, health care reform if we had metabolic syndrome reform. And here are the diseases we're talking about. Okay. Now, what is metabolic syndrome? Well, it depends on who you ask. So here are six different uh, international medical organizations. And they've come up with six different classifications and criteria and definitions for metabolic syndrome. So what does that tell you? It tells you that at least five of them are wrong, and probably all six. And we, at the American Heart Association, try to define metabolic syndrome in children, as you can see there, and we couldn't even do it. You know, it's kind of like Potter Stewart and pornography. You know it when you see it. But if you actually try to, you know, come up with a real honest-to-goodness bona fide definition, it's kind of hard to do. And part of the reason for that is because it's being defined phenomenologically with cutoffs for these different diseases, 90th percentile for blood pressure or waist circumference above this certain amount, etc. You know, the bottom line is these are all kurtotic and skewed 
normal distributions, there's no bimodality to these things. So it's very hard to say, oh yeah, if you've got 89th percentile for blood pressure, you don't have it, but if you have 90th percentile, you do. I mean, this makes no sense. It's like a dysfunctional Chinese restaurant. You know, one from column A, two from column B. This is a ridiculous way to make this argument as to what is and what isn't metabolic syndrome. It is much easier to define the metabolic syndrome mechanistically. That is, Where's the subcellular dysfunction? Where's the insulin resistance? Because that's the one thing everyone does seem to agree is very important in terms of the manifestations. So let's talk about insulin resistance for a moment so we can understand it. So this is the standard model of insulin resistance, the model that pretty much all of you have been exposed to. It starts here, you get fat. You eat too much, you get fat. The fat makes IL-6, TNF-alpha, other cytokines, reduces adiponectin, makes your liver sick, and your si liver isn't very happy, and therefore, because of the insulin resistance, you get increased hepatic gluconeogenesis, increased hepatic glucose output, and then that goes back to the beta cells, and so the beta cells have to make more insulin, and so what you end up with here, excuse me, is a vicious cycle, but it starts here in the fat, and all the other things come secondary to that. This is the adipocentric view of metabolic syndrome. It starts with the fat. Is that true? Yes or no? That's the standard mantra. Let's see. Here's the exception that proves the rule. So this is a different disease. This is called lipodystrophy. Okay? So, easily identifiable veins and very little musculature, but bottom line is there's very little fat except on the face and in the, um, the back of the neck. They have a dorsal cervical fat pad, but they basically have too little fat. And they have massive acanthosis nigricans, which is a marker for hyperinsulinemia. It's insulin working on the epidermal growth factor receptor of the skin. And they have metabolic syndrome to beat the band. These people have too little fat, and they have big time metabolic syndrome. So let's dissect that out. Here's lipodystrophy, here's obesity. So fat mass, lipodystrophy down, obesity up. Leptin, lipodystrophy down, obesity up. Yeah, adiponectin goes in the same direction, so maybe that's important. Inflammatory cytokines go in opposite directions. Yet metabolic syndrome is a preponderance. I mean, it's a, it's a hallmark of lipodystrophy, whereas for obesity, it may or may not be there, depending. So what is this telling us? Well, it means that metabolic syndrome can arise from either too much or too little fat, because it's not the fat that counts. What do obesity and lipodystrophy share? Well, they share this thing called insulin resistance. The question is where? Now, the dogma, the standard dogma that everyone learned, and which I learned a long time ago, is if you fix the obesity, the metabolic dysfunction will improve. And this is what we have been trying to do now for the past 30 years. Fix the obesity, the metabolic dysfunction will improve, people will get better, except for one thing. It doesn't work. Because if it worked, I wouldn't be standing here and we wouldn't have triple the number of obese children that we had in 2001. Because it doesn't work. Because no one can fix the obesity. Because obesity is leptin resistance. Leptin's not working because if the leptin were working, you wouldn't be obese. Obesity and leptin resistance are synonymous. So what happens when you start losing weight? Within 12 hours of starting a diet, your leptin levels are now 25% lower than they were before you started the diet. So now you've added leptin deficiency on top of leptin resistance. So what does your brain see? Your brain sees starvation is what happens. And so what does it do? It makes you eat back what it is you were trying to reduce. There's your yo-yo dieting, and this is what's going on. So we have not been successful because we're not fixing the problem. The problem's the leptin resistance, and we're trying to deal with it by trying to make the patient leptin deficient. It can't work. It's not going to work. In fact, the reality of the story is the opposite. If you fix the metabolic dysfunction, the obesity will improve. When you fix the thing that's causing the leptin resistance, then you become leptin sensitive, and when you become leptin sensitive, you will lose weight, eat less, and start exercising more of your own accord. And we have done this now many times in double-blind placebo-controlled trials by lowering insulin, because insulin is the blocker of leptin signaling at the level of, of the hypothalamus. But that's a whole other hour, and I'm not going into that with you. 
So I want to reframe the debate for you, if you will. Obesity doesn't cause metabolic syndrome. Obesity is a marker for metabolic syndrome. Now, if you choose to define metabolic syndrome as obesity plus stuff, which two of the six medical organizations do, then of course you're not going to see this because you've defined it as such. But what I'm telling you is anyone can get metabolic syndrome and obesity is a red herring. Obesity is along for the ride for the same reasons that all these other diseases occur as well. The question is, what's going on? So obesity is not enough. Insulin resistance is not enough because you can be insulin resistant and not obese. What kind of obesity? What kind of insulin resistance? That's the question. In which tissue are all tissues affected equally and are all insulin pathways affected equally? We have to start parsing out how insulin works in order to understand this. Now, just across the river, over at Joslin, oh, sorry, not, sorry, Joslin's over here. Just on the other side of the fence, um, Ron Kahn and his colleagues over at Joslin have created eight separate insulin receptor knockouts, and you're all very familiar with them, I'm sure. Well, the bottom line is six of those eight are protected from obesity. They have insulin resistance in specific tissues. My favorite is this one down here. Everybody know about the Padirco mouse? The glomerular podocyte insulin receptor knockout mouse. So these animals are completely euglycemic. They have absolute euglycemia and they have the worst diabetic nephropathy of any animal model there is. Now how is that possible if they have normal blood sugar? Because it was the insulin that caused the glomerular dysfunction, not the blood sugar. That's how. Because insulin resistance counts. But they're not fat. They have their normal weight, and they have normal other metabolic parameters. The only two that cause obesity and metabolic syndrome are these two. The Lyrco mouse, the liver insulin receptor knockout mouse, and the brain, the Nirco insulin receptor knockout mouse. Now, we don't have time to go into the brain one. That's another hour. So we're just going to talk about liver today. So let's talk about what insulin does to the liver. So here's the pancreas making insulin over here, and here's the liver, and there are two pathways that are involved. The first, insulin uh, phosphorylates 4 ked protein O1 or FOX01, which excludes it from the nucleus and thereby prevents the transcription of enzymes involved in gluconeogenesis. This is what decreases hepatic glucose output. And so you maintain euglycemia. That's how insulin maintains euglycemia. But at the same time, insulin stimulates this guy over here. SRABP1C, sterol regulatory element binding protein 1C, which is the transcription involved in de novo lipogenesis, in fat making in the liver. And so your triglycerides go up. Well, those triglycerides then get packaged with ApoB100 into very low density lipoprotein, get exported out of the liver, circulate in the blood as triglyceride, and then either cause atherogenesis as a direct effect or get stored in fat under the influence of insulin there instead. So this is how insulin keeps your liver healthy. It keeps your blood sugar down and it exports the fat out and your liver stays healthy when your liver stays insulin resistant. So now let's make an insulin receptor knockout mouse. Let's take the insulin receptor out of the liver. That's the Lyrco mouse. This is Ron Kahn's Lyrco mouse. So here's the pancreas. Now it's making insulin hand over fist. Why? Because your insulin receptor is gone. Your FOXO1 can't get phosphorylated. It goes to the nucleus and it makes all those gluconeogenic enzymes. And so you become massively hyperglycemic. And that massive hyperglycemia then feeds back and your pancreas has to make insulin to beat the band. And so you are markedly hyperglycemic, markedly uh, uh, hyperinsulinemic, and you have diabetes. But do you have metabolic syndrome? No. And the reason is because you haven't stimulated SRBP1C. So your triglycerides are low. So you end up with low serum triglycerides, high glucose. Is that metabolic syndrome? No, that's not. It's this, but it ain't metabolic syndrome. It's sick, but it ain't metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome? Here's metabolic syndrome. So the pancreas is making lots of insulin because the FOX01 isn't being phosphorylated, so there's your hyperglycemia. But somehow, somehow, that SRABP1C still has to get stimulated in order to make all that triglyceride. And the question is, how do you do that 
with only one insulin receptor. And there's only one insulin receptor in the liver. And if you knock it out, how do you still get that? This is the holy grail of metabolic syndrome. How do you explain the dichotomy between insulin's action on glucose versus insulin's action on fat in the liver in metabolic syndrome? That's the $64 zillion question. Everybody got it? That's what we're after. So, in order to explain metabolic syndrome, we are looking for a ubiquitous factor that virtually everyone is exposed to that promotes obesity, preferably visceral adiposity as opposed to sub-Q, promotes hypertension, and induces selective hepatic insulin resistance by blocking FOXO1, but yet stimulating de novo lipogenesis at the level of the liver. So what is it? The question is, are all calories the same? Because if they're the same, then you'd say it's just calories. And of course, that's what everyone out there believes. Maybe some people even here in this room, I don't know. But this is basically what we've been taught, and this is what we've, what's been promulgated. So this is from Coca-Cola's coming together advertisement of last year that you all probably remember, where they said they're going to help try to fix obesity. And they said, beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. So as far as they're concerned, you can get your calories from carrots, you can get your calories from cheesecake, you can get your calories from Coca-Cola, or anything else with a C for that matter. It doesn't matter because if you eat more than you burn, you will gain weight, and if you eat less than you burn, you will lose weight. We are bomb calorimeters. We blow the calories up, and whatever we recoup, that's what happens to us. A calorie is a calorie. That's the mantra. That's the message. Well, I don't believe in common sense. I believe in data, and so do you. And the data say something else entirely. Because what the data say is that some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently because a calorie is not a calorie. So if a calorie is a calorie, it's eat less, exercise more, except for one thing. It doesn't work, and the reason it doesn't work is because a calorie is not a calorie. So we have to get off that message in order to solve this problem. So the question is, okay, which calories are the problem? Well, I think this is where we start, okay? So here's high fructose corn syrup up here. One glucose, six-membered ring, one fructose, five-membered ring. Fruct glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, you make it. That's how important it is. But fructose, fructose is completely vestigial. There is not one biochemical reaction in the body that requires dietary fructose. The only place you can find fructose in the body is in semen, and it was made there from glucose via the polyol pathway. So you do not need dietary fructose for anything. We have patients with hereditary fructose intolerance who are missing the aldolase B in the liver that normally would convert fructose to glucose. Those patients become massively hypoglycemic. I have to take care of them. We find them because they have a seizure when they're six months old, when they've had their first bottle of juice, and they are put on a sugar-free diet for the rest of their lives. There's a registry of these patients at UC Berkeley, and they are the healthiest people on the planet. You do not need dietary fructose to survive. The notion that you need sugar to live is a mistake. It's a mistake. Well, here's sucrose over here. One glucose, one fructose. O-glycosidic linkage between the two. The enzyme sucrase in your intestine cleaves this in about a nanosecond. You absorb the two moieties just the same as you would with for high fructose corn syrup. So in America, we have this stuff, and the rest of the world has this stuff, and it doesn't matter because everyone has the same metabolic disease now. And the question is, is this why? So I'm going to be talking to you about two articles, one being in a popular press article, the New York Times Magazine, Is Sugar Toxic by Gary Taubes. And this was our uh, nature comment two years ago, the toxic truth about sugar. Now, I'll tell you, I have taken a lot of heat because this sounds pretty extreme. So the question is, is this real or is this hyperbole? You know, am I just a you know, zealot? Am I just guilty of extremism? So the question is, is sugar toxic? Well, let's define toxicity. 
the degree to which a substance can damage an organism. I think we can all accept that as a definition of toxicity. It's come straight out of the dictionary. It does not distinguish acute from chronic toxicity. Certainly acute toxins are FDA regulated. That's in their charter, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act of 1938. But chronic toxicity is not uh, in the FDA charter. They're not interested in chronic toxins. So we have to be. Now, in order to, for me to make my definition, I am going to have to meet these requisites. I have to show you that fructose is an independent risk factor for disease, that it is exclusive of its calories, that it's not because of its calories, that it's exclusive of obesity, it's not because of its effects on obesity, and I have to show you causation. Correlation is not enough. I have to show you causation. So I am tying one hand behind my back. But I have to meet this bar or you will ride me out on a rail, call me a zealot and a heretic, and basically feed me to the wolves. Worse yet, there are a lot of people out there who criticize the studies that have been done on fructose toxicity because they say, well, it's all animal models and you have to feed them an enormous amount. And, you know, that's just not rational and, you know, you can't take animal studies and compare it to humans. And I accept that as well. So I will limit my discussion to human data only, human consumption only, and in doses routinely ingested so as to get away from this question of overfeeding. So I'm tying my other hand behind my back as well. So I'm going to have to fight this fight with no hands, okay? Just my brain. Okay, let's start. So first of all, everyone says this is about obesity. Is it? Is it really? I would say no, it's not. So here is refined sugar consumption in America. Here's high fructose corn syrup consumption in America. And here's the rates of obesity in America. And they do not correlate very well. They are not concordant. There's something missing, though. Let's add it in. Fruit juice, that's also sucrose. But it still doesn't correlate very well. The fact is the concordance between obesity and disease is, and obesity and sugar consumption is actually not very tight. That's true. Now let's look at this a little bit more carefully. So here is U.S. sugar consumption in grams per day, not over the past 30 years like the food industry likes to show it to you, but in fact over the last 200 years. And let's put the different pieces in. Here's the growth of the sugar industry here with all of the, you know, Louisiana and Hawaii and all that. Here's stabilization right here. Here's the rationing that went on in World War II. And here's the advent of high fructose corn syrup back in 1975. Everybody with me? So there we are. And people are always talking about the fact that, well, sugar consumption is going down. And indeed it is. It's gone down by about 8% over the past eight to 10 years, and that's shown over here. The question is, where is that compared to where was that? So we are still consuming 1,000% more than we did when sugar was a condiment as opposed to a food staple. Now, does sugar cause weight gain? Well, let's look at what foods cause weight gain. This is from Mozafarian, right, ac right, right down across the fence, and his data from the New England Journal, from the uh, physician study and the nurse's health study show that numbers one and, number, uh, and two are potato chips and french fries. I agree. Potato chips and french fries, the most obesogenic foodstuffs. Where does sugar come in? Well, sweets and desserts, sugar sweetened beverages, distant third. Distant third. When you look at correlative studies, you can see that SSB servings per day increases BMI score in four and five-year-olds, but this is correlative. And in prospective correlative studies, juice servings per day increases BMI's Z score in inner-city Harlem toddlers. But these are still correlative studies. They're not causative. You can't prove that the sugar did it. Now let's look at meta-analyses. So this was work from Tay Marenga in British Medical Journal earlier last year. And what she showed, either lowering sugar or raising sugar, there's your diamond right there. It does not cross zero, so it is significant. But when you do the math on this, it's only excuse me, worth about 0 0.8 BMI points. But we have a 7 to 8 BMI point problem. So sugar accounts for about 10% of our obesity epidemic. Not all that much. A little, but not all that much. 
depends also on who funded the study. Because this just came out like a month and a half ago. This is Resba Strollo in plus one. And what she showed was that it depends on who funded the study. So if the food industry funded the study, five out of six studies said no effect of sugar on obesity. Whereas if the studies were independently funded, 10 out of 12 studies said yes, sugar effect on obesity. So instead of reading the abstract for you medical students and graduate students, do not read the abstract first. Read the funding source first. Okay? So you know what you can expect from the abstract. Okay? First rule of good academic uh, discourse. How about the opposite? How about if you take the sugar away? So this is Kara Ebling's study that was in the New England Journal. And you can see that when you take the, su the sugar-sweetened beverages out, your BMI goes down, and particularly in Latinos, where sugar consumption through sugar-sweetened beverages is enormously high. So that would at least suggest a me mechanistic component. So let's sum it up. Does sugar cause weight gain? Sure. Is sugar a cause of obesity? In some, likely, but not in everybody. Is sugar the cause of obesity? Not even close, not even close. But remember, obesity's not a problem because you don't die of obesity. You die of the diseases that come with obesity. Metabolic syndrome's the problem. So now let's talk about the effects of sugar on metabolic syndrome per se, independent of its effects on obesity and independent of its effects on calories. So remember this slide here, okay? Let's add some things to it now. The American Heart Association says this is the threshold for consumption based on their 2009 uh, scientific statement, which I helped write. This would be the theoretical threshold based on the analogy that we've made between sugar and alcohol, because basically they're both metabolized by the mitochondria in a similar fashion and ultimately throw off VLDL and de novo lipogenesis in a similar fashion. So this would be the theoretical threshold. So when was the first time that anyone first thought that there was a chronic metabolic disease epidemic? When was the first moment that anybody realized there was something going on? Anybody know? 1924, when Haven Emerson, who was the New York City Health Commissioner, found that diabetes rates in New York had increased sevenfold from three in 100,000 to 20 in 100,000, 1924. When was the next time? 1931, when Paul Dudley White, in his epic treatise, Heart Disease, basically said that heart disease was going through the roof as well. And when was the last time that somebody said, something is going wrong with chronic metabolic disease? 1988, when we first saw the advent of adolescent type 2 diabetes. In 1980, there were zero patients with adolescent type 2, and today there are 57,000. It was 1988 when it became an issue. Now, where do these plot onto this temporal relation? This is obviously not correlation. This is not causation. But it's kind of interesting, wouldn't you say, that when we reach the stabilization point, that's when the uh, 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 phenomena started to occur. And then when we added some more, yet more phenomena started to occur. It's interesting. So let's talk about sugar and heart disease. So here's the triglyceride, the HDL going down with percent of calories as sugar, so it's calorie independent. And here's the triglycerides going up in the same way. And this is in the NHANES database. Here's what's happening in adolescent girls. So if your uh, percent of total energy from sugar is less than 10%, here's your HDL. And if you're greater than 10%, here's your HDL. And this just came out a week ago. And this is the most important one. This is from Frank Hu uh, at, uh, at Harvard and also the CDC. This came out a month ago. And what they did was they looked over the decade from, nine, uh, sorry, two decades, from 88 to 2006, and they looked at the percent of calories consumed as sugar adjusting for obesity. This is your histogram of percent of calories from sugar. The median was 18%. And what they found was that the hazard risk ratio for cardiovascular mortality, dying of a heart attack, the inflection point was at 15%. And it went parabolically up from there. And if you were consuming 30 to 33% of your calories of sugar, your hazard risk ratio for a heart attack was four. 
Well, that's what our teenagers are up to. That's where our teenagers are right now. So expect a lot of heart attacks and deaths soon. And this is correlative, but it's prospective, and it takes into account both obesity and total calories, suggesting that sugar is an independent risk factor for heart disease. Now let's do diabetes, where the data is even better. So in order to, do, to show that sugar is a proximate cause of diabetes, I have to, number one, <coughs> explain the ca confound by obesity, plausibility, mechanisms, correlation, and finally, I have to show causation. Again, both hands tied behind my back. So let's start with the confound. So here is the prevalence of diabetes against the prevalence of obesity worldwide. And you can see that there is a very clear correlation, and I don't argue that. But there are also some countries that are obese without being diabetic, and there are also a whole bunch of countries that are diabetic without being obese. So they are not concordant. And in fact, if you look at the data from the IDF, obesity is increasing at the rate of 1% per year worldwide, yet diabetes is increasing at the rate of 4% per year worldwide. If diabetes were a subset of obesity because obesity was the cause, how could you explain that? Clearly, there are some people who are getting diabetes unrelated to obesity. So the confound with obesity is there, but not necessarily the thing that's driving this. Now let's talk plausibility. So remember we talked about the liver. So this is non or alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But here's normal liver over here with all the nice sinusoids. And here's the bile cannuliculus over here, looking very nice. And here is substrate dependent fatty liver disease. And the question I pose to the audience is, is that alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Can you tell? They're exactly the same. At every level, they are exactly the same. And in fact, this is sugar. Sugar did this, but they look exactly the same. In fact, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the liver manifestation of metabolic syndrome, and it is concordant with the other phenomena associated with metabolic syndrome. So the prevalence of NAFLD goes along with large waist, high glucose, low HDL, high triglyceride, and high blood pressure, irrespective of obesity, and the same thing is true in kids. And we now have one-sixth of children who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from sugar unrelated to weight, because it's 38% in obese, obese kids. And in the Korean population, they showed that NAFLD was a primary predictor of type 2 diabetes, irrespective of calories and irrespective of obesity, that NAFLD predicted diabetes. So the question is, all right, if that's the case, which is the more important fat depot? Everyone knows the sub-Q fat depot, and everyone knows the visceral fat depot. Well, there's a third fat depot. It's the liver fat depot. And most people don't measure that. Well, this study did. And what they did, this is Fabrini et al. from Sam Klein's group at WashU St. Louis. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of people and did their, slice, their CT slice at the, at the abdomen, and they quantified not sub-Q fat, but rather visceral fat and hepatic fat. And when they held hepatic fat constant, they showed that the visceral fat had no relation to any of the insulin dynamic parameters. Whereas when they held visceral fat constant, the hepatic fat explained all of the visceral fat, uh, the, all the insulin dynamic parameters. In other words, the insulin resistance was related to the hepatic fat, not to the visceral fat. The visceral fat was along for the ride. And when they want, asked the question, OK, where did that hepatic fat come from? Here in gray, non-systemic fatty acids, non-systemic. Well, we know where systemic fatty acids come from. They come from the diet, or they come from your fat tissue when you undergo lipolysis, as happens in type 2. But where does non-systemic come from? It comes from right in the liver, made in the liver. Let's talk about how. So now let's go to mechanisms. So again, the common wisdom is that a calorie is just a calorie, and sugar is just empty calories, except that chronic fructose exposure promotes liver fat accumulation specifically, and that promotes metabolic syndrome, and chronic fructose exposure increases protein glycation, the Browning reaction, the Maillard reaction, which I will show you. So here's the metabolism of glucose. Now, 
Most of the glucose gets metabolized elsewhere. Only 20% hits the liver. And of that 20% of glucose that hits the liver, virtually all of it ends up as glycogen. Very little of it makes its way down to the mitochondria to participate in the TCA cycle. If it does, hopefully it gets burned off and you get ATP and carbon dioxide, but maybe a little bit of it will end up leaving the mitochondria as citrate via the citrate shuttle and acting as the substrate for what is known here as de novo lipogenesis. And remember our SRBP1? That's the thing that's being driven, and that's what insulin does. It drives through AKT, it drives SRBP1. That's how you export the fat out of the liver. So you keep your gluconeogenesis down through the phosphorylation of FOXO1, yet you export your energy out of the liver as triglyceride when insulin is working. Everybody with me? And glucose <coughs> makes that happen. So glucose, for lack of a better word, is neutral. Now let's look at another energy substrate. Let's look at alcohol. Notice, alcohol enters, most of it enters the liver, only a little bit of it gets uh, metabolized elsewhere. You see glycogen anywhere? Alcohol doesn't go to glycogen. Where does alcohol go? It goes straight down to the mitochondria, overwhelms the mitochondria. The citrate gets thrown off, and now you've got a lot of citrate, so you get a lot of v uh, de novo lipogenesis, and so you get a lot of VLDL. And that's why you get the hypertriglyceridemia of alcoholism. And some of it won't make it out. will precipitate as a lipid droplet, and now you have alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the liver has to take more of it with the bolus because only the liver metabolizes alcohol. So now let's do fructose. Here's fructose. You see glycogen anywhere? Now, it actually can go to glycogen through fructose 6-phosphate through a backdoor pathway, but only when glycogen is depleted. So if you're an athlete and you consume a sports drink, it's not a problem because fructose 6-phosphate will help rebuild glycogen. But what if you're glycogen replete? Then it doesn't. Then what happens is it comes down to the mitochondria, just like here, and forces that same de novo lipogenesis pathway. And this is the hypertriglyceridemia associated with fructose, including the lipid droplet. Now, remember, we're looking for a ubiquitous factor that stops FOXO1 phosphorylation, yet stimulates SREBP1. Remember, that's our holy grail. Well, when you become hepatically insulin resistant, which happens because fructose 1-phosphate activates this enzyme here, C June and terminal kinase 1, which then serine phosphorylates IRS1, so you become insulin resistant at the level of the liver, now you can't phosphorylate FOXO1. There's your gluconeogenesis. There's your hyperglycemia. And how do you get the DNL? Well, turns out fructose 1-phosphate stimulates this guy over here. This is Jerry Shulman's work from Yale. PGC1 beta, PPR gamma coactivator 1 beta, which stimulates SRBP1C+. These guys over here reformulate xylose 5 phosphate and drive carbohydrate response element binding protein. You get double de novo lipogenesis without insulin. So there you are. No phosphorylation of FOXO1, but double de novo lipogenesis to make liver fat. Here's your ubiquitous factor, and here's how it works. So hepatic insulin resistance prevents FOXO1, and fructose 1-phosphate stimulates PGC1-beta and SRBP1C. And here's proof of that. This is a study that my colleague, Dr. Jean-Marc Schwartz at San Francisco General did, where they did a crossover studies on normal adults consuming high complex carb uh, diet and then isocalorically high fructose containing diet. No change in calories for the four weeks. And they did it in randomized fashion. And it turned out when they looked at the lipid fraction by MRS, 38% increase in liver fat on the same number of calories because a calorie's not a calorie. The fructose drove liver fat accumulation irrespective of calories. So here's a different model of insulin resistance. The old model started with the fat. You ate, you gained weight, you made fat, and you ended up with TNF-alpha and IL-6. How about it starts here? with fatty liver due to fructose consumption. That fatty liver, because of the insulin resistance, drives the beta cell to have to make more insulin in order to make the liver do its job. Why is the pancreas in series with the liver? Because the liver is the primary target of insulin action. Why doesn't the pancreas, pancreatic vein drain into the inferior vena cava? Because the insulin has to go to the liver first. And when the liver's sick, the pancreas responds, and so you get hyperinsulinemia, and that drives fat accumulation. 
So could it start here? Yeah, it could. I'm not saying it doesn't. But could it start here? Oh, you bet. And that's where it starts in kids. Second problem. Here are five pictures. They all have one thing in common. What do they have in common? <laughs> I'm not sure. There's, they do have one thing in common, though. They're all brown. They're all brown. Okay? The common link is the browning or the Maillard reaction. It's why bananas brown. Okay? It's what hemoglobin A1C is, right? It's non-enzymatic glycation. So the bottom line is you can roast your meat at 375 degrees for an hour, or you can roast your meat at 98.6 degrees for 75 years. The answer is the same. You brown. And if you don't believe me, here's newborn rib cartilage right here, nice and white, and here's 88-year-old rib cartilage, nice and brown. And if you had orange juice this morning, you're browning seven times faster. Why does this happen? So here's glucose in the linear form. Here's glucose in the ring form. Here's the space-occupying model. This hydroxymethyl group is sticking up, not bothering anybody. And this six-membered six ring is relatively stable. So at 37 degrees, pH 7.4, 99.2% of the glucose is in the ring form where the aldehyde is protected. Only 0.8 is in the linear form where the aldehyde is free. But obviously, the higher your blood sugar goes, the more that's going to happen. And that's why a A1Cs are a marker for diabetic control. But here's fructose. Here's the linear form. Here's the ring form. Here's the space-occupying model. Notice, two hydroxymethyl groups sticking up button heads against each other and a five-membered ring with a lot of ionic strain. And so this is much easier to break apart. So at pH 7.4, 37 degrees, 97 percent is in the ring form, 3% is in the linear form, where this reactive keto group is just as uh, reactive as this reactive aldehyde group. So that explains why fructose does this seven times faster. And every time it happens, you not only bind to a protein to reduce its flexibility, but you generate reactive oxygen species, which if not quenched by an antioxidant can cause cell dysfunction and death. So here's that rate of reaction in a test tube, glucose against fructose, seven times faster, 100 times the number of carbonyls or reactive oxygen species. This is done in vitro. These are hepatic sites in culture grown with toxic aldehydes. Here's the ED50, where 50% of cells are killed. Notice fructose and glucose, no problem. But then take those same cells and treat them with just enough hydrogen peroxide to uh, metabolize their uh, and non endogenous antioxidants. So you put them at vulnerability because you've now gotten rid of their antioxidant capacity. Now all of a sudden, the fructose has the same ED50 as the toxic aldehydes. In other words, the only thing saving your liver from the toxic effects of fructose is it, the inherent antioxidant capacity of the liver, which of course is quite high if you eat properly. But if you eat processed food, if you eat junk food, then it's quite low. And this is the reason why our kids are getting non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and cirrhosis. And this is shown in this slide. This is in a NAFL clinic from Duke University showing the grade of steatosis and the stage of fibrosis related to fructose consumption in even a group with uh, alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, correlation. Here are the 10 most obese states in the nation. Anybody any from any of them? I used to live in Memphis. It's pretty bad. Here are the 10 laziest states in the nation. What's going on over there in Nevada? I guess you can only burn so much energy going like this, right? Here are the 10 most unhappy states in the nation. What do you see? Here's the adult diabetes rate. Here's the adult heart disease rate. And here's soda per capita consumption. So what do you see? you see correlation, right? But you can't assume directionality. Is it that soda causes obesity, laziness, unhappiness, diabetes, and heart disease? Or is it that obese, lazy, unhappy diabetics with heart disease drown their sorrows in a can of soda? <laughs> you can't tell. No directionality. Agreed. Here's what's going on worldwide tripling of sugar consumption over the past 60 years. Here's per capita consumption. Notice Brazil. Brazil used to be so poor that they couldn't even afford their own sugar. They always produced it because they had the Amazon, you know, sugar cane. But 
They couldn't afford it. Now they can afford it because they're a brick country, right? They got Ember jets and biodiesel and Olympic Games and World Cups, and they can afford their sugar now. And guess what? They now have the highest rate of increase of type 2 diabetes on the planet. Who has the highest rate of diabetes? Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, UAE, and Malaysia. Why them? Why them? No alcohol. But they got soft drinks like they're going out of style. Because it's hot, and the water supply is a question mark, and no alcohol. This is their reward, and they reward themselves several times a day. But I personally would rather have alcohol. <laughs> because you can only drink yourself under the table once a day. It's a joke. <laughs> So, what data do we have that says that soft drinks cause diabetes? Well, this is from the EPIC Interact study, and this is looking over a decade, adjusting the model for total calories and for obesity, and each sugar-sweetened beverage can increases your risk for diabetes by 29%. Now, this is still not causation, but it's prospective correlation, pretty darn good. So now let's get to causation. This is our work. We published this last year. What we did was we took the Food and Agriculture Organization Statistics Database, which listed total calories, fruits excluding wine, oils, roots, tubers, pulses, nuts, and vegetables as fiber-containing foods, meat, cereals, and sugar, sugar, crops, and sweeteners as line items by country over the decade. We then mel so we melted that with the International Diabetes Federation Database for diabetes prevalence over the decade, and then we melted that with the World Bank Gross National Income Database to control for poverty, urbanization, aging, obesity and physical activity, to ask the question, what about the world's diet predicted diabetes over the decade? 204 countries, complete data for 154, the 50 were not different by the Hausman test that we, uh, sorry, the uh, Heckman test that we did. Here's the data monitoring analysis that we did. It was pretty darn severe. Generalized estimating equations with a conservative fixed effects approach with a hazard model to control for selection bias, as I mentioned. This is the important one. We had the movie. We didn't have the snapshot. We had the movie. We had the whole decade. So we could determine what preceded what. Did any change in the food supply pre change, predict the diabetes change, or did the change in diabetes predict the change in food supply? Because we had time. Okay? And we controlled for all these things. So here's what happened. Over the decade, diabetes went from 5.5 to 7%. That's what the World Health Organization and that's what the UN is clamoring about. And here's the effects model for sugar. And you'll notice the diamond does not cross zero. And here's the adjusted model for sugar and diabetes prevalence. Here's your take home. This is what you need to write down. Only changes in sugar availability predicted ch changes in diabetes prevalence. Nothing else. Nothing else. Every 150 calories extra that the world consumed or any given country consumed increased their diabetes prevalence by a total of 0.1%. And this is factoring in obesity and everything else. But if those 150 calories happened to be a can of soda instead, diabetes prevalence increased 11-fold by 1.1%. And we're, in America, not drinking one can of soda. We're drinking two and a half. So take that up to 2.4%. These data, because of the way they were manufactured and because of the modeling that we did, actually establish what is known as causal medical inference. The same uh, criteria that Austin Bradford Hill ascribed to tobacco causing lung cancer, which is still the gold standard, we have met that bar as well. There are no randomized controlled trials of people smoking. Okay? You're not going to have randomized controlled trials of people eating more or less sugar because it takes 50 years to see this. This is observational data, but it is done in such a fashion as to provide causal medical inference. That is, the dose, the higher the dose, the more the diabetes. Duration, the longer the duration of exposure, the more diabetes. Directionality, those countries where, diabetes, uh, where sugar went up, diabetes went up. Those countries where sugar went down, diabetes went down. And most importantly, you have to show precedence. Because whenever sugar changed in any country, diabetes followed three years later in both directions. That establishes proximate cause. So I have done it with two hands tied behind my back. I've shown causation of sugar with diabetes. Now, just so you don't think that I am fructocentric, there are actually four items in our diet that are metabolized 
in the same fashion via the mitochondria and cause the same chronic metabolic disease. Trans fats do this, but we know that and they're coming down. Branch chain amino acids do this, leucine isoleucine valine. There's no place to store them. If you overdo, they only get turned into energy, they get deamidated to alpha ketoglutarate, enter the TCA cycle, and overwhelm the mitochondria and end up as liver fat as well. Alcohol, but kids don't drink alcohol, and fructose. And the thing they share are these, these have these in common. This is why it's not about being a bomb calorimeter. It's about being an exquisite biochemical system. The liver is the only site for energy metabolism. It is not insulin regulated, and there's no glycogen pop-off. So the liver becomes overwhelmed. The mitochondria have no choice but to turn the excess into liver fat, driving chronic metabolic disease. So here's how we put the whole thing together uh, in a paper last year. So here's fructose entering the liver cell. Here's the binding to proteins to generate reactive oxygen species, the Maillard reaction. In the mitochondria, you generate ROSs as a matter of course. And finally, whatever you lay down as visceral fat will generate inflammatory cytokines, which will activate NADPH oxidase. And so your ROS pool is significant. The question is, what happens to it? The goal is to detoxify it, to quench it. And that happens in the peroxisome. And of course, that's why TZDs work, is that's where ROSs go to die. But what if you don't have enough peroxisomes? What if you don't have enough antioxidant capacity? What happens? Well, then the ROSs go straight over here to the endoplasmic reticulum, which are right next door to the mitochondria on EM, and that's on purpose. And what happens is they interfere with protein folded, known as the UPR, the unfolded protein response, also known as ER stress. And if that happens in a pancreatic cell, then you have insulin deficiency, and if it happens in a liver cell, you have insulin receptor deficiency. Either way, you get insulin secretory problems, insulin resistance problems, you get diabetes. In addition, the lipid droplet that comes from the fatty acyl-CoA that had no place to go causes problems with IRS-1 uh, serine phosphorylation, thereby leading to hepatic insulin resistance, driving hyperinsulinemia, and driving the process. So the subcellular effects of mitochondrial overload is what metabolic syndrome is about, and that's why none of these definitions make any sense. This makes sense, and there's no drug target. There's no place to intervene because mitochondrial overload can't be stopped. If you overload, there's no way to get rid of it. The only options are reduce the substrate availability, that's called diet, but not eat less diet because that will induce leptin deficiency on top of leptin resistance. Eat less sugar, that you could do. Reduce hepatic flux, that's called fiber. Make more go down the intestine so the bacteria get it instead of you. And finally, increase clearance. That's called exercise. Because exercise ups the TCA cycle VMAX. So it burns off before it gets turned into liver fat and keeps your liver healthy. At the American Heart Association, we know that this is a problem. And we recommend reducing sugar intake from 22 teaspoons per day, which is average for America today, down to nine for males and six for females. And I was happy to be part of the uh, writing group for this. And you know what? Now the WHO knows it as well, because this just came out five days ago. You probably all heard about it. To reduce your sugar intake to 5% of calories. Ten years ago, the WHO said 10% of calories, and the food industry fought it tooth and nail. In fact, Tommy Thompson went on a jet and extorted $406 million from the WHO to bury the document that said 10%. Well, now they're saying 5%, and good for them. So here's what's happened to our food supply as we've been asleep at the switch, meats down 10% because we're all told to go low fat. Fruits and vegetables, exactly the same. We're all told, told, eat your fruits and vegetables. You know what? We're eating just as much as we always did. Grains and baked goods, up a percent. And that's a problem because of hyperinsulinemia and driving energy deposition. Dairy products, 13 down to 10.6% because now we're all lactose intolerant. And finally, Processed foods and sweets, 11.6 up to 22.9%. A doubling in the span of 30 years. That's what's happened. This is about processed food. Processed food has eight things wrong with it. Not one, eight. Not enough fiber. Make your microbiome work. Not enough omega-3 fatty acids. Make your neurons work. Not enough micronutrients. Detoxify reactive oxygen species. Too much trans fats. Line your arteries because you can't metabolize the trans double bond. Branch chain amino acids, 
drives liver fat accumulation. Omega-6 fatty acids promotes inflammation through erratic ionic acid. Too much alcohol for all the reasons we know. And finally, the big kahuna, the big guy on the block, and the one the food industry specifically uses to get you to buy more sugar. There's only one answer. It's called real food. That solves all eight at the same time. So I'm not the anti-sugar guy, I'm the real food guy. Okay? And there are a lot of people who are real food guys. Problem is, the American government is not. So in summary, metabolic syndrome could start in the fat, but it can also start in the liver. And that's where it starts in the, in, for kids. Added sugar causes both hepatic gluconeogenesis and lipid formation via the FOXO1 and DNL <coughs> pathways. Added sugar does promote weight gain. It's a cause, not the cause of obesity. If we talk about obesity, we lose because the food industry has so many subterfuges to blame it on something else. Let's talk about chronic metabolic disease. Obesity is a red herring. Fructose meets all the criteria, all the definition for toxin. It possesses unique metabolic characteristics to promote cellular damage exclusive of its calories and exclusive of its effects on obesity. Added sugar is an independent risk factor for diabetes, which I showed you, through plausibility, mechanism, correlation, and now causation. It meets the scientific and legal definition of proximate cause. You could sue over this, and it will happen. Sugar is the alcohol of a child, because that's the thing they're exposed to. And we currently consume triple our limit, and we need to get it down. The problem is we can't get it down because the food industry won't let us. So the questions I want to leave you with, your homework assignment. Can our toxic food environment be changed without government or societal intervention? especially when there are potentially addictive substances involved, because some people think that sugar is addictive. Whether it is or not, it's certainly abused. And number two, can we afford to wait to enact these regulations? Because Medicare will be broke by the year 2026. And I'm going to be 69 in 2026, and I want my friggin' Medicare. And so should you. Last, if a researcher isn't willing to follow his data into the policy arena, who will? That was Jeremiah Stamler the father of cardiovascular epidemiology, who I'm sure you, most of you know. Okay? It's time for scientists to start influencing policy, since the policy people won't. So these pay, uh, are for the general public, lots of academic articles for the uh, scientists in the room. We have started a nonprofit to promote personal and, uh, uh, health against big food. And it's called the Institute for Responsible Nutrition. Here's our websites. Let me know if you want any more information. This is going on all over the world as we speak in the UK. Action on Sugar is 22 academics, academics, not uh, advocacy people. In Australia, New Zealand, fighting sugar and soft drinks. I just came back from Auckland last week where they had a symposium basically trying to get the government to listen. And most importantly, on May 9th, this movie will be released in America in theaters near you called Fed Up, and it will outline what has happened over the last 35 years, and it will uncover the disinformation campaign that the food industry has been put into practice, aided and abetted by the U.S. government. And the goal is to try to turn this aircraft carrier around. With that, I want to thank my collaborators at UCSF, at Toro, at San Francisco General, at Stanford, uh, my colleagues in advocacy, uh, uh, the CTSI at UCSF, UC Hastings, where I did my Master's of Law degree, and at Berkeley. Bottom line, there's a lot of people out there who are damn pissed off. And I hope I've pissed you off. And with that, I will close and thank you. start in adipose tissue. I don't think that you, it, 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 I'm, not, I'm not excluding that as a possibility. I think you can make somebody have metabolic syndrome because you overload their visceral fat. I think you can, okay? But that's not what's going on in children. What's happening in children is we're seeing this and, and their ALTs are up. 
And that's, you know, telling us that they're liver fat. And we've done hepatic ultrasounds on kids' normal weight, and they've got liver fat already. So if they're normal weight and they've got liver fat, it can't be the, uh, the adipose tissue. So I think this is a specifically liver phenomenon. I think when the liver gets sick, bad things happen. Thanks so much for that and for your work. Um, you implied uh, by giving the example uh, of browning, mm -hmm. of, of a phenomenon that goes on over time. And I think you, you what you have introduced uh, by your focus on this process in children is, is enormously important. Uh, what what uh, what do we know uh, about the possibility that some of the damage over time of this exposure uh, can be reversed? Huh. And let's say if it, if it uh, begins in childhood right. by a change in, in dietary intake or exposure. Right. So we know for sure that we can reverse the hepatic steatosis. That we've, we've done that, many people have done that, by altering the diet, by altering dietary composition, by reducing uh, uh, total caloric intake and, of, and by exercise. So you can absolutely reduce the steatosis. The question is, once the fibrosis starts, once the necroinflammation starts, can you reverse that? And no one has been able to show that yet. Now, the um, Tonic study, the Treatment of Nash and Children study, which is the pediatric equivalents of the Pivens study, that's uh, NIH sponsored, we're a site for that. And so the data on that suggests that, uh, that vitamin E might play a role in that because it's a an an liver antioxidant, so that might be one place. And there's also some data from Jeff Schwimmer's group at UCSD that metformin can play a role in that as well by basically altering the fuel gauge of the cell by upping AMP kinase. And we do both. I mean, we basically give kids vitamin E and we give kids metformin in an attempt to try to do that. There's also data in adults on pioglitazone. And the reason is because you're upping the peroxisomes. And again, that's upping your antioxidant capacity. Um, we haven't done that in kids. So um, the answer is there's a little bit of data to suggest that some of it's reversible. But once the fibrosis starts, you can't get rid of it. It's forever. You know, we're running quite late, so those students who have to leave should leave. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I like the end when you said, like, you know, we need to change something, and that's where I feel like original female, I'm from Europe, and I see it's more diverse there, but here I didn't come here and see the power of the food industry is so big because we have this big population in America, it's all one system. Right. And I have, like, I'm sad and I'm a bit, like, worried. How are we going to do this? Because there are at one point people are called to help and, like, you come out and reach out to and then there are other people like money on the table, love it. So in a kind of way, I'm like asking you, what is the way you see to go? Well, the, you have asked the uh, 64 zillion dollar question. I mean, you know, all right, so now what do we do, especially with all of these stakeholders, you know, who are very entrenched? And I agree with you. This is a huge problem. And there are more stakeholders here than virtually anywhere else. And we're all arguing with each other about what needs to happen. Well, I'll tell you what needs to happen. What we need is a new food business model, okay, which rewards the food industry. I'm not against the food industry making money. Okay? I am against the food industry making money by poisoning us, because that's what tobacco did. Okay? And we got, ahead, we got ahead of that finally. It only took 50 years, but we finally you know, got there. The food industry has told me directly, categorically, right to my face, this is a direct quote from a major food industry executive. Quote, we can change. We've had to change before. We had to change back in the 1980s when we were told to go low fat. We could change again with two provisos. We won't go it alone, and we can't lose money, unquote. In other words, the food industry doesn't care what they sell as long as they sell. As long as their bottom line is not altered, as long as they can make their Wall Street earnings, their quarterly reports, and generate an increase in stock price, they don't care what they do. So the only way to do that in today's climate, because we changed the food business model in America back in 1971, when Richard Nixon basically wanted to make food prices cheap, because he knew that fluctuating food prices caused political unrest. 
And so he said to his agriculture secretary, make food cheap. Take it off the political table for presidential elections. And Earl Butts, his agriculture secretary, said three things. Row to row, furrow to furrow, get bigger, get out. Those were his admonishments to the food industry. We need to roll that back. Because what's happened is they've put quantity over quality because they were told that they were going to be recompensed for volume, not for quality. And what we need is we need a new food business model that looks a lot like the old food business model and reward them for doing the right thing instead of for doing the wrong thing. Problem is, right now, government's making too much money off this themselves to change it. So we need to start putting some public pressure on members of Congress to turn this around. And there are people in Congress who want to turn it around, and I know their names. Thanks, Amy. There are lots of ways to fill an adipocyte. I do not in any way, shape, or form think that fructose is the way you fill adipocytes. In fact, fructose is the way you fill liver, not, not, not adipocytes. I I mean, I'm just saying that there are multiple ways to get to the liver. I'm yeah. not even pushing this on the adipocyte. Mm -hmm. I think there are many ways to get to, you know, even in some Iran Khan's model, which is don't quite diabetes, but they cause obesity mm -hmm. or protecting. I, I don't argue that. There are a lot, like I said, there are a lot of things that are wrong with our diet. There are a lot of foodstuffs that can drive this, but this is a specifically egregious problem. This yep. has obviously been very provocative, and it's a riveting conversation, but it's 20 after, and I think it's Sorry. So feel free to leave. If you want to stay after the question, you can do that. And other than that, the graduate students and postdocs can also ask questions. 